Good afternoon. Uh, I understand our speaker's going to come momentarily, so let's, let's get started. So, um, hi there. Good afternoon. Glad to see you all. Uh, I'm Bob Hyatt. I'm going to be uh, uh, introducing today's, uh, today's talk and colloquium. This is the first annual UCSF colloquium on population health and health equity. Uh, and we're very excited to, uh, to have a program for you today. Our goal um, in this um, uh, undertaking is to recognize all the uh, exciting work that we're doing at UCSF in population health and health equity, and to define our role as an academic medical center in advancing the health of populations we serve. Um, now, uh, the uh, reputation of UCSF in the basic sciences is very strong, as it is in the clinical sciences. Um, and despite a lot of work that we do in population health sciences, the wor this work uh, is uh, uh, largely invisible to many people in the public, um, to our sister institutions, and to our um, sometimes our own students and our own uh, faculty. So our, our goal is to take this work that we do, and this is a partial list of the uh, departments, centers, and institutes that we have here at UCSF working in population health uh, and make it visible. So what do we need to do to do that? I think uh, as Liz Watkins has said, we want to make the invisible visible. So. Um, the kinds of challenges that we face in population health are uh, obvious to us all. We talk about them every day, uh, and these kinds of things concern us as a society and as ind individuals. So um, I won't read the list, but I'm sure you can see the, the, the scope and the nature of the things that we think are population health problems, things that we don't normally think of uh, when we're treating patients or maybe when we're looking at a nematode. But what do we do in a, in a, in a uh, academic medical center to make a difference in these kinds of problems? So uh, some time ago, uh, with the support of um, Dan Lowensing, our uh, executive vice chancellor and provost, we began thinking about how to um, conceive of a program in population health and health equity at UCSF. And these are the individuals that put some uh, considerable work and time into thinking about this problem uh, over the last year or so. Um, and what we did was think about what's going on in other sister institutions, uh, what kinds of things are going on here locally, uh, both in terms of the uh, amount of research and its nature. Uh, we constructed a, a website, which is uh, a, the scaffolding of which is going to be available. Um, and we've uh, thought about what the um, definition and, and goals of, of such an initiative should be. So what is population health? Um, it, it is something that uh, is debated by many people and, and disagreed upon in terms of a definition. But we offer a, a very simple uh, statement, population health science aims to improve the health of populations and reduce, reduce inequities. But we also want to say that this is a field of inquiry that includes not just uh, approaches to populations, but uh, multi-level uh, understanding of disease from biologic, clinical, and social behavioral sciences. And the uh, field really tries to generate knowledge about the distribution and determinants of health and disease. And another unique aspect of it is it frequently draws in uh, other disciplines and others, other sectors in society. So uh, it may be um, um, labor, maybe education, maybe transportation, all of these other aspects of society come into play when we're trying to solve these kind of problems. And we're trying to discover a precise approach to interventions for population health promotion to translate findings into practice and policy. So uh, our vision, just simply stated, uh, that we offer is the uh, UCSF will generate, apply, and disseminate knowledge needed to reduce inequities and improve the health of populations. And the way we see our mission uh, is to create the synergies across UCSF to enhance our capacity in this area and discover and translate more effective practices and policies to optimize the health of populations. 
These activities are based on pillars of discovery, training, and translation. So uh, I'm now going to uh, uh, introduce uh, Dan Lowenstein to uh, have some introductory remarks. Um, if you uh, are a tweeter, there's your hashtag. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, hope you enjoy the afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Dan Lowenstein, and I serve as your executive vice chancellor and provost, which basically means I have the position of working with the chancellor and the rest of the leadership of UCSF to look after the academic mission, the, you know, the, the work that we do to generate new knowledge and to train the next generation. And I was invited to give some introductory remarks because in part I've been incredibly enthusiastic about the initiative that uh, was catalyzed roughly two years ago when we first met as a group um, and has evolved to, I think, this momentous occasion of the in inaugural um, a symposium on population health and health equity. Now, I have the remarks that were prepared um, to sort of make the statement that the leadership of this uh, great institution truly believes in the work that all of you are involved in and enthusiastic supporter and champion and rah-rah, <coughs> they're all here, but I decided last night to deliver a slightly different, very brief message. And that is that like everyone here, um, I've devoted myself to a particular area uh, in health and in medicine um, because I am passionate about uh, trying to improve the lives of people who suffer from epilepsy. So that's been my career. And when you become fairly expert um, in an area, um, you're asked to give talks about the work that you do, to give research talks or overview talks. And for the last year or so, I've been giving an overview talk about the world of epilepsy research and the patients that we serve. And I just wanted to share three or four, I think it's three or four slides that I've been routinely using um, as part of my talk. I try to convey what I think the future of uh, epilepsy is going to be. And as you can see, the question is what will precision medicine being applied to patients with epi epi epilepsy look like? And the point of the whole message is that it's going to require precision at multiple levels in order to um, really understand how to care for the patients that we serve. But what's really striking to me is that most of the people in my field still don't have an appreciation for the, the whole notion of a multi-level look at the care of, of, of patients, the needs of patients with epilepsy. And most of you should be quite aware of this. You wouldn't be in, in, in the field of population health and health equity if you didn't have an understanding that we have to move away from the sort of Cartesian focus on the, the, um, the smallest uh, uh, part of the biology of disease in order to really advance our understanding. And this network is analogous, of course, to Google Earth, where in order to understand the existence of an individual and what might be happening to them, we really need to have the whole global um, multi-layered understanding. So the point here is the work that, that I've been doing, um, uh, along with everyone else, in the field of epilepsy, and you can substitute hundreds and hundreds of other disease categories for the word epilepsy, we are all realizing in my field that we're never going to be able to solve this problem to reduce the suffering of people with epilepsy uh, until we're able to collect information on large populations. And it's specifically, um, I've now realized that the work that I've been doing in genetics, I've devoted the last 15 years to trying to figure out, along with hundreds of other people around the world, the genetics of epilepsy, we are stuck because we've been able to figure out the single genes that cause epilepsy that have a Mendelian uh, inheritance, but we, we are not going to be able to solve the problem of the vast majority of people suffering from the, this set of disorders without having huge data sets, information on as varied uh, a population as, pop as possible, tens of millions of people. Similarly, the, the microbiome story, um, 
the microbiome story, I think, is arguably one of the most amazing new uh, recognitions of the biology of humans. Um, but the folks doing microbiome work are realizing we're never going to be able to figure out how the microbiome influences an individual without having large data sets on the microbiomes of, again, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be millions of people. And finally, the exposome. The, the exposure of, 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 of humans to the environment. Again, we can't understand what the meaning is of the exposure to a single individual without having an understanding of what it means for whole populations to be exposed and understand all the different categories and groups of people that are involved. So uh, this was simply my personal appeal for those of us who do laboratory work, who are doing sort of more standard genetics work, we are not going to be successful without the efforts that you are all making uh, as it relates to trying to understand um, health at the level of populations and the diversity within the populations. So I'm really, really grateful that you're making this initiative. I guess another way of putting it is the tradition here has always been that the laboratory basic scientists sort of rule the day and they always sort of get their way. My message is that it's very, very clear that this century is going to be is going to be the century of population health, um, because the basic scientists are are realizing that uh, it's going to take a, a true collaboration in order for us to be successful. So, so with, with that, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, uh, Kirsten Bibbins Domingo. She is the uh, still fairly new chair. <laughs> Uh, chair of the Department of uh, Epidemiology and Biostatistics and the inaugural Vice Dean of Population Health and Health Equity. Kirsten, have a great afternoon. I'm sorry I can't join you, but I'll be watching the video. Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, hearing from our executive vice chancellor, you can see the excitement that uh, many of us have um, about the commitment at the highest level to population health and health equity at our institution. This is obviously, you know, this is not something new for us. We have many in this room who've been doing this work for a long time. And I think what's exciting now is to think about uh, what we can do uh, collectively uh, to have a greater impact in this particular area. Part of my charge at this um, is to, uh, in, in this role, was to actually convene the different groups on campus that are working in population health and health equity. Obviously, you heard from Dr. Hyatt that there's been a lot in the leadership to try to think of what we could do to raise awareness. And I want to let you know probably of three areas areas that um, we're working in now that you're going to hear more about in the next several months. Um, and we want to engage you in those areas as well. One is um, uh, my charge is to think about with others about how we enhance the infrastructure that could help the work that we're all trying to do to do it better. One area we want to invest is in the data infrastructure on this campus. So the data that many of you already work with or would like to be working with most effectively, how do we make that available to do the population health type of work that we want to do? And what can we do with our own clinical data at UCSF Health and across UC Health to make it more useful for population health type work across the state of California. That's one area you'll hear more about. And one of my colleagues says, watch out for a survey that's going to be coming in the email, so please respond. Um, the second area is um, really being able to raise the visibility. And so you heard Dr. Hyatt talk about our website and areas that we're going to try to do to connect um, different groups on campus to do this. We have a, a, a big opportunity, I think, right now in our capital campaign, which is really focused. One of its grand challenges is partnering for health equity. And I think many are engaged to try to think about how do we highlight the work that we are doing and what we could be doing better, thinking, uh, thinking about what's possible into the future. And then the last area is uh, what we're launching today, which is a, hopefully a series of colloquia to have the discussions with all of you. One of the themes that you'll hear today is, what does it mean for an academic medical center like ours, which has many people like uh, Dr. Lowenstein doing uh, scholarly work in genetics, what does it mean for, and delivering clinical care, what does it mean for us to do population health? What does it mean for us to have an impact on the health of populations? And so today you will 
you'll hear from a fabulous speaker who I'll introduce in a moment. But then you'll also hear about um, initiatives that we have on this campus in this area. Um, and then we'll have a discussion at, at the end of the day um, uh, that will include Dr. Galea about um, how we as an academic medical center, um, along with other academic medical centers, figure out how to contribute in this space. So I know that it's hard for people to take the day off, um, but I hope you will take the day off and engage with us in this conversation. Um, and if you have to leave, please feel free to come back, because I think it'll be a, an exciting uh, set of talks that, uh, that we and discussion that we hope you'll participate in. But right now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our Keynote speaker, so Dr. Sandra Galea is a physician and epidemiologist and leading voice in the emerging field of population health sciences. He was named one of Time Magazine's epidemiology innovators and has been listed by Thomson Reuters as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. In his role as Dean of Boston University School of Public Health, Dr. Galea is engaged in shaping the next generation of public health leaders while advancing cutting edge research in key areas like gun violence, urban health, and population health effects of disasters. He has published over 700 academic articles, 13 books, and is a regular contributor to a range of leading publications, including the Boston Globe, Harvard Business Review, Wired, Time, and Fortune. Dr. Galea's latest book, Healthier, 50 Thoughts on the Foundations of Population Health is a collection of reflections on contemporary public health challenges and thoughts on the future trajectory of the field. It provides a public health perspective on the most urgent issues of our time, including climate change, inequality, racism, and the well-being of LGBT groups. Clifton Leaf, editor-in-chief of Fortune, has called it the book everyone interested in health should read. Julio Frank, former health minister of Mexico, called it an intellectual feat. We're so thrilled to have Dr. Galea here with us, and please join me in welcoming him. Thank you all for having me here. Thank you all for being here. You know, when one, one comes, one is invited uh, generously to give talks, uh, usually your bio is read that you've written yourself carefully. But uh, Dr. Bibbins Domingo read a bio which I did not write, and it's better than anything I ever wrote. So. <laughs> <laughs> Had I known that, I would have come a long time ago. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's, it's, really, it's really delightful to be here. Thank you for having me. It's really great to see uh, the interest in um, this topic at, um, at UCSF. And uh, I, I was asked by um, uh, Dr. Hyatt to um, talk really about population health science broadly and to try to make the case as to why we need to think about population health science as a, an, an ineluctable part of understanding the challenges that we face right now. And I thought I would do that by actually talking about three things that I suspect have been on anyone's mind who's interested in health, which is guns, opioids, and obesity. And uh, now I realize it's a bit of an odd mix to talk about guns, opioids, and obesity, but the case I'm going to make is that the, the principles of population health science can allow us to actually think about these three and that there are commonalities that these three epidemics have. Now, I'm going to lean on a lot of my work around population health science and I will explain what that is in a second. And my expectation is that you will disagree with something, some of what I say, and that's okay. My expectation is that people in the audience will write ever better things about population health science because as you heard from both uh, Dr. Hyde and Dr. Bims Domingo, um, the field is emerging. The field is actually fairly new. And uh, I have written some pieces on it. I've written some pieces. And, and if you look at those pieces I've written, uh, uh, they almost always end with, in part, this is a challenge to other scientists to write other pieces, to push our understanding forward, to say that what we're doing is right or not, so we can actually advance our thinking. So with that framing, I'm going to plunge in. So let me, let me first of all frame this a little bit by making the case that I actually think that guns, opioids, and obesity are the three epidemics of our time. Now every time you say something like this, somebody's going to disagree and say, what, what about X? Which is fine, which is okay, but I'll, I'll make the case to why I think these are the three that in the past decade really have correctly grabbed, grabbed our attention. Let me start with uh, opioids. So this is drug overdose deaths. And let me see if I can actually point. Can I point? Yes, I can point. So this is, uh, we're now at about 64,000 deaths from opioids a year. And what I want you to see is that that is higher 
than the peak of other previous epidemics. So that is higher than the pre peak of the motor, uh, motor vehicle uh, death epidemic, which was in 1972, higher than the peak of the HIV epidemic, which was in 1995, and certainly higher than the peak of gun epidemic, which was in 1993. And you see this extraordinary, right, extraordinary uh, exponential rise in deaths from uh, drug overdoses. And, uh, and of course, you know that now we're all talking about it. My, my question to us all is why were we not talking about this over here when we're at 40,000 deaths, which was roughly, by the way, in 2010, eight years ago. And as, this is an epidemic that has really transformed parts of the country. And perhaps a, one way to look at it is this way. This is a ma series of maps. Um, this is a, uh, a heat map of drug overdose deaths from 1999. And the way to read it is you go from left to right. Can I actually walk here? Is this? Can you still hear me if I do this? Yes? OK. So if you just go from left to right, right, 1999 all the way to 2015, and I would ask you to D don't think of this as drug overdoses. Think of this as infectious disease X. How would we feel if this were infectious disease unnamed? Do you think we would have waited till 2018 until 64,000 people were dying? Or would we have been paying this much attention to it in 2010 when, 40, when quote unquote, only 40,000 people were dying from this? That's what's happened to drug overdoses in this country. And uh, um, uh, one, more, one more slide on this. And this is uh, the percent of deaths classified as drug-related in the US is the red line, and a bunch of other countries is in the, in the gray line. And the reason I'm showing this is to make the case that while other countries have also had issues with, uh, with uh, increase in uh, drug overdoses, we are by far and away outliers. So drug overdose as one particular epidemic, and deaths as one particular part of that epidemic. That's number one. Let me switch. I'm going to switch epidemics now. Firearms. So we've been talking a lot about firearms lately, in the past two years in particular, and largely we've been talking about firearms in the past two years for, because of mass shootings and a lot of school shootings as well, and I'll get back to that in a second. But I want to point out that the firearm epidemic really has been stable for about uh, almost 20 years now, since about the turn of the 21st century. The peak was early in the 90s, as I showed earlier in 1993, but look, since about 1999, we have had roughly the same number of people who've been dying from guns. It's increased in the past two years, since 2016, largely because of of an increase in homicide among young men, particularly young black men. Um, but largely, it's been actually a stable um, rate of uh, this epidemic, of the, um, of the gun epidemic. And uh, just to put it in context a little bit, we have much, much higher rate of gun-related deaths, particularly homicides, than all other peer countries. So this is the United States at the bottom, and you compare us to all the other peer countries, we are roughly in the four to six-fold greater range of deaths from guns than any other country. So by any definition of an epidemic, which is something that is typically over the baseline that's expected, this is an epidemic. So that's drugs, that's guns, and now let me talk about obesity. Obesity used to get a lot of attention. Those of you who sort of uh, were in, uh, well in your academic career 10 years ago, you will have remembered everybody used to talk about obesity 10 years ago. Now nobody talks about obesity. Well, you know, we're not really that thinner, so we should actually still think about obesity. And, um, um, just, to, just to sort of frame the obesity epidemic, this is, uh, these are slides I suspect you've all seen. These are CDC, BRFSS. This is the density of obesity in 1990, which is, um, I guess, almost 30 years ago now. And uh, the darker the color is, the more percent of people in the state were obese. That's 10, 15 percent. That goes to 2000, where now you have a bunch of states with 20, 25 percent people obese. And then you go to 2010, where you have a bunch of states with more than 30 percent obesity. And the obesity epidemic has had the same spread, really, the same extraordinary spread that we see with an epidemic, which I showed you. Um, around the um, uh, drug overdose epidemic. So these are three really consequential epidemics. They are three epidemics that have had enormous impact on the health of populations. And they are in no small part, although not only, contributing to this. So this is, this slide is called, ironically, American exceptionalism. And the way to read this is that um, the um, over the line in the blue is when the difference, the, there was a positive difference in life expectancy in American life expectancy versus other OECD countries, other high income countries. So all the way until about 1990, right, we actually had higher life expectancy than other OECD countries. And after 1990, we've now had lower life expectancy and getting worse and worse. In fact, in this country, as many of you know, life expectancy took a turn. Um, in 2016, we had the first real reversal on life expectancy in this country since the flu pandemic of 1918, and that carried through in 2016-2017. In, uh, so we have been losing life expectancy um, uh, in the past, um, roughly in the past 30 years. 
And the recent paper that just came out shows we actually know what's causing this. We actually know what's causing us to lose life expectancy. This is not a mystery. This is a, this is a very nice paper. And uh, the way to read this is these are the factors that contribute to life expectancy. The way to read this is bars to the right are places where we are gaining life expectancy. And bars to the left are places where we are losing life expectancy. So you see we're gaining life expectancy in heart disease and uh, malignant neoplasms, etc. But then you look at what we're losing life expectancy on. And we're losing life expectancy in unintentional injuries, Alzheimer's disease, suicide, and then things related to drugs, drug poisoning, opioid-involved poisoning. So essentially, we are losing life expectancy in drug-related deaths, in injuries, a lot of which, and suicide, a lot of which are due to guns, and then neurological disorder, Alzheimer's, which is in large part due to population aging. So sometimes when I speak to students, I say, well, if you actually want to know what's going to be the issue in the next 10 to 20 years, this is the only slide you need. You're actually dealing with drug-related deaths, gun-related deaths, and you're dealing with neurological disorders, many, many of them related to aging. And that's what's actually nipping away at our life expectancy. So we know that these epidemics matter. We know that they matter. We know that they're consequential um, to the health of populations. So now, having labeled those three, Right? I, the reason I, I, I thought I would do those three, and, and I must give uh, Dr. Hyatt credit here because we sort of bounce back and forth as to why I could present, uh, what I should present, is because I actually think there is really is no rational way of talking about guns, opioids, and obesity together unless you take a population health lens. I actually, I actually don't know any other way of doing it. I don't know any other, I, I don't know any other intellectual framing that can allow you to say, can we draw insight that cuts across these three different epidemics? And let me try doing that. And I'm going to try doing that now by leaning on the principles of population health science. So first of all, what do they have in common? Well, I've sort of said what they have in common, right? They are important, they cost a lot of money, they're pretty complicated, and they're resistant to simple solutions. If there were simple solutions, we would have figured it out by now. We would have like done it. We would have made us all thin. We would have stopped firearm-related uh, injury, and uh, we would have stopped the drug-related deaths. Right. So we all accept that that's what's, that's the case. So the question then is, can population health science contribute? Obviously, my answer is yes. My answer is yes. Population health science can contribute, and I think population health science provides an enormously useful useful framework for thinking about epidemics like this. Now, I am basing. My, my, my statement on principles of population health science that come from a book that I wrote with uh, my good colleague, Dr. Catherine Keyes. So this is a definition that we used in the book of population health science, which actually is pretty complementary to the one that uh, Bob presented, which is ultimately we're studying the conditions that shape health within and across populations and mechanisms through which these conditions manifest as the health of individuals. And if I may editorialize here for a second, we, we thought very carefully about including mechanisms in this thinking, because in no way do we think that if we are interested in the health of populations, that that precludes an interest in discovery science or in the genetic and molecular basis of health and disease? And I, I say this with, with intentionality, recognizing where I am speaking, that uh, this is a place where, um, as you just heard from your provost, uh, there are a lot of world-class scientists thinking all the time about the genetic and molecular basis of disease, and that's okay. That does not have to be in contradiction with thinking about the health of populations, but I do think that the health of populations becomes an overriding concern and the discovery science becomes a tool to the end of understanding the health of populations, which I would suggest is frequently the inverse of how we do th things in our biomedical research establishment. Now, in this book, we articulate nine principles of population health science, which you can't read, but that's okay. But I'm putting them up here because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to focus on four of them. I'm going to highlight four of these principles, and I'm going to show you how those four pertain across these four epidemics, across guns, opiates, and obesity, by way of showing how principles of population health science ultimately can help us grapple with, understand what might matter when dealing with epidemics like this. And just to be clear, you know, one can look at the book like this as saying, we've said absolutely nothing new. Because if you go back and look carefully at the work of population health scholars, principally the work of Jeffrey Rose that comes before us, 25 years before us, you know, a lot of this was in there. And a lot of this has been in there. A lot of people have been writing around pieces of this for about two or three decades. In another respect, 
what we're doing is actually dramatically new because we're actually saying, putting a stake in the ground and saying this is its own freestanding intellectual area of inquiry and we should apply it to these big problems. And of course the truth is somewhere in the middle. So I would encourage anybody who's interested in this to go back, to go back and read some of the canonical works that come long before anything that, that I've ever written on this that really are the foundations of thinking about the health of populations. So let me start with the first principle. Population health. Population health is not a dichotomy. It is a continuum. Now this is actually quite important, and it's important that I was actually reflecting about uh, Provost Lowenstein's comment that he was talking about uh, um, his work looking at the, at the genetic basis of epilepsy. And you know, he said a couple of interesting things. He also said he's watching, so if he's watching, uh, he can uh, tweet a, a question to me. Um, uh, the, um, you know, he said the, the, the hunt, the hunt for, uh, for Mendelian genetic transmission of epilepsy has come to a halt, recognizing that ultimately this is, a, this is not a, a, a single, uh, simple, uh, common mutation uh, origin for epilepsy. And, uh, and that has now moved to a much more, a much more holistic view of the complexity of the production of epilepsy. Now, I, I would argue that's true actually for any number of diseases that we think of as being genetically determined. But I would argue that the other side of the equation is that our habit of thinking of disease as dichotomous is in and of itself an oversimplification. It's not simply on the exposure side, it's also on the outcome side. Now this is actually very easy to show. It's very easy to show when you deal with things like obesity. So let's deal with obesity. So this is a very simple population curve of obesity. You have body mass index at the bottom. So all I'm showing you here, this is body mass index and this is number of people. So you have you know, the modal uh, in this population is uh, people with a BMI of about 23, 24. Now, what percent of the population is obese? Well, what we do with that is we take a line, draw a line at 30, and uh, say if you're over 30, you're obese. That, of course, hides the population behind it. Because if I cut off a line at 30, I'm, you're missing the fact that actually most of this population is actually doing just fine. But contrast with this where now I'm drawing a line at 30, and there's that population, but then now you have the other population where a whole bunch of it is not over 30, but still has very high BMI, right? So you have multiple different manifestations of the distribution of health within populations. So I go back to the definition of population health science, which is we're concerned with the distribution of health within populations, and the distribution of health tells us a lot about populations and can guide how we may want to act and if we do not pay attention to distribution of health, we may intervene in quite different ways. Now that's obesity. Now you're all saying, okay, obesity, we all know BMI, that's fine. What about other things? What about guns? What about guns? Well, what has the national conversation on guns been about? Well, the national conversation on guns has been about those of us dying from guns, right? About gun deaths. Was gun deaths what we should be worried about? Well, if we're actually gonna be worried about the net number of firearm injury, gun deaths are in some respects a small proportion of our problem. This is uh, from, um, probably the best data out there about national burden of firearm injury. Only about one-third of gun injuries are fatal. Two-thirds of gun injuries are non-fatal. From those two-thirds, half of them actually are hospitalized, and the other half are not hospitalized. The non-hospitalized are typically injuries to the extremities that are mild. The ones that are hospitalized, there are papers that have just been published that show that the accrued cost, both the medical cost and the financial cost of uh, gun-related injuries that's hospitalized are worse, for example, than other injuries like motor vehicle accidents. So once you stop thinking of guns as having a dichotomous outcome, dead, not dead, all of a sudden you realize that this is a bigger part of the problem. When I wrote a, uh, a commentary in the Boston Globe actually about this particular issue, um, I was targeted quite vehemently by the NRA um, because I dared raise this issue. Um, because they're right, actually, they're right to target anybody who says this because this, in many respects, is a bigger problem than gun deaths, right? So it's not dichotomy, it's a continuum. We have gun-related gun injuries. And in fact, when you look over time, remember how I showed you that uh, number of firearm deaths have been stable since 2000? Not so with non-fatal. Non non-fatal has actually been going up since 2000. And if you look at where the growing burden of injury is, it is actually non-fatal um, homicide attempts. So this is, um, this is from a paper that our group published. And uh, see, this, this is homicide. This right here is uh, the increase in homicide, which is driven largely by non-fatal homicide attempts. You have very, very few uh, non-fatal suicides, by the way, because one of the, one of the problems, one of the reasons that um, guns are such a problem from hell is that um, the uh, chances of killing yourself if you try to kill yourself with a gun is very, very high. It's over 95%. But homicide is a different matter altogether. So you actually can have, um, we have in this country a stable 
overall epidemic in terms of firearm deaths, but an increasing epidemic in terms of non-fatal firearm injuries. And that's been the case since roughly for about the past 20 years. So, principle one, if we're going to think about health, we should think of it as a continuum. That's true for obesity, that's true for guns. And now let me um, conclude this principle by again going back to obesity. So this is um, cholesterol, which is of course one of the uh, consequences of obesity. And what I'm showing you here are two population curves. One population curve is um, uh, people with heart disease, that's the dotted line. The other one is people without heart disease, that's the black line. These are data from the Framingham study, which is run by the school that I have the privilege of leading right now. Um, uh, and the reason I'm showing you this is because I ask you the question to say, what, uh, what do you see when you look at those curves? They look roughly alike, don't they? Yeah. Now this is Framingham data, as everybody here probably knows. Framingham data are the data from where we got the, uh, the cholesterol Framingham risk equation, which ultimately was the, the important risk equation to say cholesterol is a risk factor for heart disease. But these are data where it came from. Well, how, how could we have all of a sudden got ourselves thinking that cholesterol is bad when the two curves are nearly exactly the same? Well, the reason we did that is because we did this. It's because we drew a line. And if you draw a line and you calculate people with heart disease, without heart disease, um, to the right of the line, to the left of the line, you come up with a two by two table on the right and you come up with an A times D divided by B times C. And what everybody can see is AD is bigger than BC, which gives you an odds ratio of more than one, which means we call it a risk factor, right? So even our fundamental thinking that underlies us thinking about things like cholesterol being a risk factor, ultimately is informed by a dichotomous understanding when we should in fact be thinking as a continuum. And of course, it is data that came out from the West Coast that actually said, well, what is our typical risk factor thinking? How does that translate into meaningful population level change? And uh, just to usually I ask the audience this question, but I'll spare you since it's after lunch. You need about an odds ratio of about 350 to get separation of curves and populations. And I, I could ask for a show of hands because I know it will be quick, but how many of you have worked on studies with, where you've come up with an odds ratio of 350? <laughs> Okay, so principle A, we should think of health as a continuum, and that has implications for these epidemics, that if we think of them, think of the obesity epidemic, we think of the firearm epidemic, as continua, we think of a different set of outcomes and as a result of a different potential set of interventions. That's principle one. Now then we move to principle five. Principle five, small changes in ubiquitous causes may result in more changes in health of populations than large change in rare causes. Now this is important. It's important because most of us spend a lot of our time, a lot of our career, thinking about rare causes that result in, uh, in a larger odds ratio. So I'll start with a metaphor. This is a metaphor from the book. You know, because I currently serve as dean, I don't have much time. So um, I, uh, I don't have pets, but I have pet goldfish. Um, uh, I love my goldfish. And uh, this, the story is very simple. I want my goldfish to be healthy, so I, get them goldfish doctors when they're sick. I tell them to exercise, run, you know, swim around their pool clockwise and counterclockwise every day so they stay healthy. I tell them not to eat too much when I feed them little flaky food and I tell them when they have goldfish relations to have safe goldfish sex. Um, um, and one day, I mean, come on, all those are risk factors, right? Obesity, walking, etc. Then one day my goldfish die. And I say, why do they die? Well, they die because I forgot to change their water. And if you've got to change the water, it doesn't matter how much they exercise, whether they have safe sex or not, they're still going to die. The metaphor is obvious, that we should pay attention to ubiquitous causes. Now, is this true? Do we, should we pay attention to ubiquitous causes? Do we forget about ubiquitous causes? You're all sitting there saying, ah, that's ridiculous, just a story. Of course we pay attention to ubiquitous causes. Do we? Well, not really. Um, uh, this is the uh, crack baby epidemic, or uh, you know, also the epidemic of funding around uh, cocaine uh, babies, and uh, this, the, um, this was in the late 80s. And uh, you know, a lot of this came from a concern that uh, babies of mothers who uh, used uh, cocaine during gestation were going to be neurologically damaged for life until um, studies came out that showed that that was not the case. This is uh, from one study that came out looking at the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. The gray bars are children of mothers with gestational cocaine exposure. The white bars are children of mothers without GCE, showing essentially no change whatsoever. So after more studies, another decade of studies, it was, it was a good period for uh, substance use epidemiologists, um, um, we found that uh, what was really going on wasn't the gestational cocaine, because gestational cocaine was indeed a high risk factor, but what was really going on ultimately was this, it was environmental stimulation, that the, that the, but the so-called crack babies were almost universally born to really poor mothers in terrible environments, and it was those terrible environments that really were mattering for child development, not so much the isolation of the gestational cocaine exposure itself. So, 
the ubiquitous cause in this case, which was poverty and uh, socioeconomic deprivation, mattered much more than the high risk factor cause, which was the gestational cocaine exposure, um, that did not matter in the long term. Now, let me go back to epidemics at hand. So what does this matter in the epidemics at hand? Well, we can start with the opioid epidemic. The opioid epidemic really is three epidemics in one. The opioid epidemic was first an epidemic of physician overprescribing. There was use of, um, of uh, medically prescribed but non-medically non used uh, prescription opioids. Then it became an epidemic of heroin use as heroin became cheaper and cheaper. And then it became an epidemic of uh, synthetic opioids. We're now in the epidemic of synthetic opioids. And uh, this is just to give you an example. In 1516, just in the past three years, look at this enormous, enormous increase in synthetic opioids. It's now, the game is all about synthetic opioids, it's all about fentanyl. That's the game, that is the, that is the ubiquitous driver of this epidemic right now. I'll show you one more slide on this. This is uh, heroin and fentanyl. Look at prescription opioids. See they weren't up? And now they've been going down for about the past seven years. See this? So prescription opioids have been actually going down for about the past seven years, as a number of things that we've been doing, including physician monitoring programs, have been working. They've actually been working, they're becoming more and more effective, but the ubiquitous cause is heroin and fentanyl. Now, the reason this is such a challenge is because the public narrative, as well as the scientific narrative, hasn't really caught up. They, right, we're, 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 we're still, we're, we're behind. We're like seven, seven, eight years behind in this. Now, that makes sense, right, it makes sense. It's actually hard to turn narratives around, but the, the reason that I actually think a population health lens helps here is because if we keep our eye on the prize and keep asking ourselves all the time, what are, what are the ubiquitous forces? What are the factors that are going to cause a large result, a substantial change in the whole population? Um, that is ultimately what we should be tackling. And really, in terms of efforts to mitigate the opioid epidemic, this is where we should be focusing on right now. That's the opioid epidemic. Let me switch epidemics. Let me go to guns. What is the ubiquitous cause in the context of the, of, uh, the firearm epidemic? Anybody? Yeah, guns. Guns. <laughs> guns. Now, now you know, you, I know you're laughing, but, but is, that, is that accepted in public conversation? No, like, 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 this is, this, so there's about one gun for, for every American. Um, um, this is my favorite slide on this. This is actually from um, an online magazine because I like the title, Americans own a ridiculous number of guns, which I sort of like. Um, uh, you know, we have 4% of the world's population and uh, we have 42% of the world's civilian-owned guns. Now, yes, guns, guns are the fundamental issue. Before this, I had the privilege of talking to some students and we're talking a little bit about, uh, about the role of uh, can a scientist be an advocate? And you know, the point I, was, I try to make on that is I think scientists should always make sure that we're based, we base what we say on the data. That is our responsibility. Having said that, some things are actually, we know, and we know that guns are the ubiquitous cause here. And there are plenty of data. I could do an hour long talk on guns, which I have in my computer, um, uh, and uh, show you data point after data point that show that guns, the availability of guns, makes the difference in terms of people, more people dying or being injured from guns. And just to show you one slide on that, here's one slide because it's a, it's a natural experiment, so it actually works well. Um, in Connecticut, uh, in 1995, there was a law uh, that required background check to obtain the permit which came in, and after that, rate of gun homicide went down 40%, and change in uh, gun suicide went down 15%. While in Missouri in, 20, in 2007, they repealed license requirements, and gun homicide went up 25%, and change in rate of gun suicide went up 16%. Just to give you, this is just one, this is the only slide I'm gonna show you on this. Because to make the point that there's a lot of undecided science, there's a lot of science we do not know about, about what we should be doing on guns, but we do know one thing, that the ubiquitous cause is guns that actually if we want to do something about the epidemic, the underlying ubiquitous cause is guns. So that's the gun epidemic, now let's move to obesity. Well, what are the ubiquitous causes in context of obesity? Well, the ubiquitous cause of obesity is largely food. And uh, you know, here's a simple slide on that. I, don't know, I won't ask how many of you had bagels today. Um, um, so 20 years ago, bagel had 140 calories, and today bagels have 350 calories. Um, French fries, 210 calories to 610 calories. Movie theater, popcorn from 270 calories to 630 calories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, this is the ubiquitous cause here. And unless we tackle the underlying fundamental issue, which is availability of food and why this is, unless we tackle with the commercial determinants that result in the availability of calorie-dense, nutrient-poor foods, unless we tackle the forces that result in that, we're not going to solve the obesity epidemic. Now, I go back to what I said at the beginning. This in no way, in no way obviates the importance and interest of 
work that barrows down into understanding the genetic or molecular determinants of obesity. But the obesity epidemic has exploded over the past 30 years, and the one thing that hasn't changed in the past 30 years is our genetic code. It's other things around it that have changed. That's ultimately what's driving the obesity epidemic. And from a population health perspective, from a population health science perspective, we should be focusing on the ubiquitous cause, and the ubiquitous cause is food. And we should be thinking about efforts like this, like comprehensive workplace obesity prevention programs that can lower weight dramatically and save substantial amount of money. So that's the second principle. Third principle, which is principle six. This is, this is sort of the most mathematical of them all, which I buried in the middle. Um, hopefully that you're still with me now. So the magnitude of effect of exposure on disease depends on the prevalence of the other factors. So this, is, this really is a, comes from the very heart of epidemiologic science, which is my disciplinary home. But it's an important point when we think about populations, because when we think about populations, it means that we cannot, we cannot afford, us, afford the luxury of being intellectually sloppy and focusing all our hopes on one silver bullet egg and saying that is going to solve everything. What this principle means is that yes, X may matter, but if X happens with Z, X and Z both matter. And you have to keep them both in mind. This makes, by the way, population health science, I think, harder than many other sciences because you cannot afford yourself the luxury of saying, let's imagine a vacuum, let's focus on only one variable. Because frequently, that one variable, which I would call the spherical cow problem, on the spherical cow joke, which I can tell you afterwards, um, uh, is, um, is, 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 does not apply in the real, messy world of complex populations. So, to illustrate that, to illustrate that, let's take obesity for a second, and let's assume that there are two things that matter for obesity. Um, uh, one of them is, Genetic, there's some genetic determination of obesity. And the other one's the environment. That is some environment which has a lot of, let's say, unhealthy food in it, okay? So let's say those two things matter. Let's agree that those two things matter. It's probably uncontroversial those two things matter. So then we say, okay, well, let's ask a question. What, given that those two things matter, how much of obesity risk is determined by your genes? So can you all come up with a percent? Keep it in your head? You don't have to tell me. Just come up with an answer. Simple question. How much of obesity risk is determined by genes? Given that genes matter, and given that the environment matters. And I'm gonna show you the answer, and then you can grade yourself. Okay, so how much is obesity risk is determined by our genes? So, let's come up with a simple population. Here's a population. These gray figures are humans in population, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a simple simulation where genes and the environment both matter. If you have the gene and you have the environment, you're going to get fat, okay? So, the genes are marked, the, the, figures, the black figures have the gene, and the green figures have the environment that's going, to make them, that's going to make them fat. And what I'm going to do is black plus green becomes red, which, makes you, which means you're fat. Okay? It's as simple as that. I'm also going to throw in some randomly obese people for other random uh, um, reasons. So, two scenarios. Scenario one. This is a very obesogenic environment. Everybody see it? It's a very green environment. Notice how I put the black, which is the gene, in dots just so you can see it behind the green. But then the black plus the green become red. You see those people become obese as well? So now you can do the calculation, which says, what's the proportion of the obesity that's due to the uh, gene? Well, notice that everybody with the gene has become obese, right? So you can do the calculation, and the relative risk of obesity given the um, gene is four, or the population attributable risk proportion is 100%. So the answer to the question, what percent of your obesity is due to your genes, is 100%. In this scenario, what about another scenario? Second scenario, look at the black figures, exactly the same position, they haven't changed. The only thing that's changed is now the green. You see how the green has now changed? A very small proportion is green. There's some black behind the green, the black plus green become red. So now we do the same calculation and say, what's the relative risk of obesity given um, a gene? It's only 1.7, Popul but the uh, population triple risk proportion is 40%. So what's the answer to the question? What percent of our obesity is due to our genes? It's 40%. What was the answer to the question in the first scenario? It was 100%. So I asked you the question, what percent of your obesity risk is due to your gene. Now, how many of you, now be honest, be honest, how many of you said when I asked that question, I can't tell you that unless you tell me about the co-occurring factor, the environment? <laughs> Two people, and Dr. Gleamore's being modest. <laughs> so, I present this scenario all the time, and every time I do it, I actually come up with a percent answer. I'm so programmed to think that. It's like, it's actually really hard to avoid. It's really hard to avoid saying, yes, there's an answer to it, right? You know why? Because we're just so used to it. We're so used to thinking, well, okay, you told me that X matters, and you asked me what percent, I'm gonna tell you a percent. 
But it actually doesn't work that way. If, I, I also told you, right, I was pretty upfront about it. I said, genes matter and environment matter. And once I tell you that, once I tell you that they're co-occurring, you can't actually figure out how much one matters without the other. And that is a fundamental principle of population health science. So under plausible assumption of co-occurring causes, gene obesity association can only be understood if we understand everything else that's associated with it. Now, is this all theoretical? You may have you heard in the introduction, I'm an epidemiologist, and epidemiologists do funny things with numbers. Um, it's not theoretical at all. There's plenty of data that show this. This is actually one of my favorite studies that looks at the FTO genotype and uh, looks at uh, the relation between uh, physical activity and BMI by people with different FTO genotypes, which are AA, GA, and GG. And those three lines, all I want you to see here is that different physical activity and BMI relationships all modified by the presence of the gene. And there's, there's a growing body of literature that shows this, that ultimately any genetic influence on obesity ultimately is modified by the environment and you, you, you cannot separate the two. Okay, so other things matter. You cannot focus on just one factor. Now, let's go to genes. I, I just wanna show you one more uh, genetic example, particularly focused on the consequence of obesity and diabetes, because Again, I, I sort of feel like being in the mecca of such thinking, it's important that we focus on, obese, on the genes a little bit. So this is from another Framingham study from one of uh, people in, uh, in uh, my school's uh, research groups. This is genotype score. This moves beyond the simple Mendelian notion of a, um, of a common of a common genetic cause and deals with a genotype score and is a cumulative instance of diabetes. So this is a genotype score and cumulative instance of diabetes, right? You see the higher genotype score, the greater cumulative instance of diabetes. Now. When you look at that, what question comes across your mind? I know when I look at that, every time I look at that, I'm like, I wonder what my genotype score is, right? Because that's a pretty cool dose-response relationship, right? For anybody who's teaching Epi 101, you can use that to teach dose-response relationships. What I really like about this paper is that it shows this figure and also shows that figure. So now those are the population curves of diabetes and no diabetes. Now, do you really care to know about your genotype score? Now, does genotype score not matter? Yes, it does matter. It doesn't say genotype score doesn't matter, but the reason that these two slides are both true is simply because of the other co-occurring factors that ultimately determine obesity. So if we are interested in the obesity epidemic, we need to understand the other co-occurring factors as well. And we cannot, unfortunately, we cannot simplify and focus on only one exposure. That's obesity, let me just switch it for a second to opioids. What are the co-occurring factors in opioids? I already talked about ubiquitous factors. I already talked about things like fentanyl. What are the co-occurring factors that we can't escape? Well, how about treatment? How about availability of treatment? And how about our attitude towards treatment? Are these important co-occurring factors? Well, this is um, receipt of substance use treatment by specialists in the country, uh, people who are age 12 or older who need treatment. Only about 10% of people actually get treated by specialists who could benefit from it in this country. Only 10%. Name one other disorder. Name one other disorder where 10% of people get the treatment they should be getting. Think, for, for, don't think of it as substance use. Think of it as infectious disease. That's too easy, I already talked about that. Think of it as an orthopedic disorder, right? Where only 10% of people get the treatment they need. It's, it's actually, it's, it's astonishing that we allow that to happen. Now, why is that? You're saying, well, it's because doctors are callous bastards. It's because doctors, <laughs> no, well, that may be true, but as I say that as, as one. Um, um, but it's actually not just that, because look at this. Perceiving need for treatment. Only 5% of people who actually could benefit from treatment could perceive a need for treatment. In fact, that 10% get treatment is a miracle. In fact, twice as many people are getting treatment as people perceive need for treatment. Now, why is that? Why is the discrepancy? Well, it's because actually people are pushed into treatment by providers and by their family members, right? So we are living, again, think of this as an orthopedic disorder where People have a disorder, and only 5% of those who could benefit from treatment think that they actually need treatment. Like, it's, it's actually inconceivable. So we have the opioid epidemic that is happening. There's a ubiquitous cause, there's a series of shifting ubiquitous causes, but that's overlaid on underlying causes which are poor availability of treatment and our collective, our collective non-understanding of what it is that ultimately could benefit from treatment. That's the third principle. Let me move on to the fourth and last principle for today. If we are serious about population health, and if we're serious about population health science, we need to tackle, to tangle with equity. Now, I, I really like how your um, population health science thinking is, is taking shape, where equity seems to be a, a core part of it, which is really terrific, and I look forward to discussions on that. Um, um, so in, in the book, we present this principle that efforts to improve overall population health may disadvantage some groups, and we need to balance equity and efficiency. Now, this is unpopular. Because 
and, and, and I put this in with intentionality, knowing that I'm going to be speaking to you, I'm hoping to provoke you a little bit, and uh, so you can all disagree with me and just sort of, and, and you can all come up with your own answer. We, we often talk about population health and health equity as though the two go together easily. In fact, they don't go together easily. In fact, not infrequently, when we try to improve population health, we are making equity issues worse. And conversely, and that is something that we need to grapple with if we're serious about population health and health equity. And given that that's what you're all doing, I thought it was worth just pointing that out. And I'm gonna, just gonna show you that with a couple of uh, graphical illustrations. So imagine a population, look at the top row. Imagine a population where there is, uh, where you have uh, DALIs, disability adjusted life years of 50, and disability adjusted life years of 25. There's an inequality of 25 DALIs in two different groups. It doesn't matter what the groups are. This is just uh, um, to make the point. Now, let's say you have an intervention where it improves it improves disability adjusted life years by one DALI for every 50. If you apply the intervention in the middle, right, the top group is gonna to go to 51, the second group is gonna to go to 25.5. You see now you've widened the inequality, but let's take a more extreme case. Let's go to the third case. You're now adding 10 DALIs per every 50. Well, the top group is gonna to go to 60, the bottom group is going to go to 30 because you've given them five DALIs. So you start with an inequality of 25 and you end with an inequality of 30. But what's your overall population health? Look at the top group. Let's say the two groups are equal in size. Your overall population health is 37.5, the average of 15 and 25. Look at the next set. The average now is the average of 30 and 60, which is 45. So you've improved your population health and you've widened your inequality. Now this is not always the case, it's frequently the case, and it's in particular the case when we do not pay attention as to when our interventions um, where they're going and who they're benefiting. Because most of the time, interventions go and they benefit groups with high underlying foundational positive factors, high underlying socioeconomic position. So it's before the intervention, if you have something equal, you give an intervention, and it typically goes to the people who already have more resources. And this is very much the case. And it's also the case around these epidemics that we're talking about. Let me go back to firearms. Firearms. This is now the, the outrage that was provoked by Parkland, which was very appropriate outrage. And uh, this was something that you heard about and you saw a lot of people um, uh, talking about this. And how many times in the press, when you read about this, how many times did you read that firearms is disproportionately a black America problem? How often did you read that around Parkland? Never, right? There are the data. There the data. This is the red line is black, the blue line is white, the green line is other race. Um, the file, fatal firearm fate, uh, rate is twice as high among blacks as it is among whites. The increase in the past two years is specifically among blacks as it is among whites. Right? So this is, now we are moving to a world where with some luck and with a change in federal administration, there might be movement on firearms. To what extent is that going to result in a widening of health gaps? Now, I'm not saying that that may not be acceptable. I'm just saying that this is something that we need to be aware of and we need to grapple with. What is it that has gotten our attention around firearms? It's mass shootings, right? Mass shootings is what's gotten our attention. Well, mass shootings, do they matter? They account for about 2%, one to 2% of annual gun deaths. That's where mass shootings uh, um, uh, account for. But they have been useful, they've been galvanizing. Are mass shootings, you're saying to me, well, okay, you said um, firearms are really a black America problem, at least twice as much as uh, white America. Maybe mass shootings are the reason that we're paying attention to this. Mass shootings really are sort of a, are different and racist. Not true, actually. Mass shootings are twice as likely to be among black schools than they are among white schools. How many of you have heard that in the media? Like hardly ever, right? So, so the point is that we are heading towards maybe a population health solution to this particular epidemic, and we are moving there blindly towards the health equity implications of what we're doing. And again, this is something that I think population health science can and should bring to the table. And the challenge I would make to you all as you're thinking about population health science is to say, if not your job, then whose job is it? Right? It is the job of those of us in academic population health to make these points. It's the job of those in population health to say, we should think about health as a continuum. We should think about the forces that are ubiquitous that really make a difference. We should think about the complexity of causes that make a difference. And we should recognize that population health improvement has equity implications. It is our job to make these points and it falls to us in population health to make these points. If we don't, nobody else will. So let me wrap up. Let me come back to the three epidemics. So 
I start off with some characteristics of the three epidemics, and I'll go to other characteristics. You know, these are people interaction with each other. They have feedback. They're nonlinear. They depend on history. There's a lot of trade-offs in trying to make one thing better versus another. There's causes and effects separated by time and space. These are all classic characteristics of these epidemics. And just to go to the obesity epidemic, just uh, by way of conclusion, this is one simple causal diagram of the obesity epidemic. This comes from the Foresight Group in London, which is pretty complicated, right? That sort of makes the point I was making. There's a whole bunch of factors that are involved. Um, uh, when you see something like this, you're like, geez, like, what do we do about this? Well, the, the, the only challenge is that this is actually a small part of that. That's really the, uh, um, the issue. So um, the reason I'm showing you this is because these definitions, these characteristics, are really classic definitions of complex population systems. Um, these are complex population systems that we're dealing with. And I think the principles of population health science can help, help, can help cut through some of this. Can, they can help cut through and help us sort out this enormous complexity. Now, you know, we're at a stage, I think, in population health thinking where we've gone far, and it's good that we've come far, and there's been methodological work in sort of in quantitative population health science slash epidemiology around trying to adopt complex systems methods to this. I am not sure, I'm not sure what the right methods are, but I do feel pretty confident that we need a lens that organizes our thinking around some principles of population health, whether they're these principles or not, or whether you all will write several papers and books that say these principles are wrong, here are the better principles, that's fine. I actually think that's the stage we're at in the field, where we actually need to have that kind of argument to move us forward. You know, the field of population health ultimately comes from, sort of from the counting in health, which is thousands of years old, but really in an organized fashion is about 150, 175 years old. And public health, which is the operational arm of population health, is the founding myth is of course of John Snow. John Snow who removed the pump handle and saved the day by stopping the cholera epidemic, right? Because now that is the beautiful, that is the, that is the heart of the simple single intervention. You remove the pump handle, everything gets better, except for the fact that that's the um, epidemic curve and that's where Jon Snow intervened. So you tell me <laughs> about how much of a difference that made. So this is not new. This is, this is not new. And unfortunately, the, the older I get, the more I realize that everything I write and say is been around for like thousands of years. I'm not sure what that says about me. Um, um, but do we keep doing this? Well, of course we keep doing this. I mean, and we centrally do this. Um, we make this mistake principally above all else in how we structure our clinical care system and how we structure our biomedical research. And what are we getting out of it? Well, this is what we're getting out of it. This is um, the life expectancy for many countries. On the x-axis, you have cost. Right, so you have many countries, you spend more, they get more life expectancy, but the US, we spend more and we get nothing out of it. For those of you who deal with like children and growth charts, it's like, you know, it's like when the child has failure to thrive and she's falling off the growth curve, and that's what we're doing here. Um, but this is largely, to my mind, a, an error of the fact that we do not, we have not, as, as, we have not, as a biomedical research establishment, elevated our sites to move beyond curative thinking to thinking about population health and to think about the principles of population health as guiding everything we do. And to tell that, I'll end with this one story. That's my last slide. This is a bluesman. His name's Blind Willie Johnson. He was born in Texas uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, Blind Willie was born, he was born poor. Uh, the story is that when he was seven, he was blinded because his uh, mother threw a lie in his face in a domestic violence incident. So he grew up poor, black, blind in Texas in the turn of the 20th century. He learned how to play the guitar, which is how we remember him. There's about 30 of his songs have been preserved on tape. And uh, he made a living busking, which is not a very good living, as you might imagine. But he made a living. He got married. Um, uh, he was living in a small um, sh shack, and that burnt down. But he didn't have any money, so his wife and Blind Willie went back to live in the husk of the burnt down shack. Uh, his early 40s, uh, Blind Willie got malaria. And uh, his wife took him to hospital, and uh, he was turned away from hospital. It's not clear if he was turned away because he was poor, because he was blind, or because he was black. And then he died. Then Blind Willie died. Now, the question is very simple. What killed Blind Willie Johnson? Well, what killed him was malaria. There's sort of no argument. It's killed malaria. Had he taken chloroquine, had he been given some drug for malaria, he would have lived. But the reason I tell that story it's because Blind Willie Johnson is the story of population health. Because yes, it was malaria that killed him that day, but ultimately his life was a consequence of generations of racial inequities. It was a consequence of homelessness. It was a consequence of poverty. It was a consequence of, uh, of uh, domestic violence. It was, a cons it was a consequence of poorly structured system that could turn people away at the door. You take Blind Willie and you create populations of Blind Willies. And you know, we are all 
by virtue of the fact that we're sitting here in this room, in this hallowed institution, far, far more fortunate than Blind Willie Johnson, right? But it's all ultimately within populations, varying degrees of vulnerabilities, varying degrees of capacities, and that's what makes populations. And that's what population health science should do. A good population health science should help us grapple with this multiplicity of competing causes, competing forces, some visible, some invisible, that generate the distributions of health in populations, going back to my definition, and that help us understand the mechanisms through which those forces become health. And I think if we do that, we can bring logic and reason to such disparate uh, forces as guns, obesity, and opioids so that we can actually help guide efforts to improve them. That's it, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for having me. Dr. Glantz. I'm glad I didn't put tobacco on there because uh, then I would have been in trouble. <laughs> you left off one important thing in your list. Nine, I think it was. Yes, sir. And, and it's that there are, that unlike most infectious diseases, there are corporate interests who are making a lot of money <laughs> causing these diseases. And I mean, I think, for example, there's a pretty strong consensus that pharma is who transformed the the uh, the, the, the opioid epidemic. Uh, it's the food industry that's making more obesogenic foods because they're more profitable. And the and and so I, I really think you have to realize that there's a there there are active intelligent forces pushing these epidemics. And and that was I think uh, you know something that needs to also be part of. I agree with everything else you said. <laughs> Well, then I should, I should quit now while I'm ahead. <laughs> um, uh, so, so the only reason I bring this up is because I, I, I don't disagree. Um, we actually, I just had a paper that just came out a couple of weeks ago in Globalization and Health, which is a, based on Luke's power framework, how to think about corporate practices and health, and uh, it addresses some of this. But actually, I don't think it's, mis I don't think it's missing here, Dr. Grimes. I actually think that uh, this actually would get, fall under number five. I actually think that, uh, that, that there is a compelling argument to be made that for a number of these forces, these, the the uh, corporate practices and the forces that create the corporate incentive structure are part of these ubiquitous forces. So I actually think that uh, when uh, Dr. Hyatt made the introduction, he, I, I do think the two most important conceptual shifts that underlie population health are a multi-level frame and a life course frame. And when you think that way, then you inevitably end up having to tangle with corporate influences. So I don't, I don't disagree. Well, I just, just not to argue too much, but actually, I agree with number five as a state. But I think it's really important to be explicit <laughs> that there are major forces that have strong motivations to cause disease. And in fact, almost all of the non-communicable diseases are being made worse by these by corporate influence. So we have a room full of witnesses and on camera that Dr. Glantz is going to write a paper that is about how uh, corporate practices fit in with a population health science framework. I would look forward to reading that. <laughs> You see, this was my challenge. It was my challenge for people to do more of this. Um, gentleman here and then over there. Yeah, and this dovetails with Stan's comments um, and your response as well. So I'm Dean Schillinger. I'm a, a study health communication. And I think you very eloquently show how a multi-level approach or, and socio-ecological model is what population health can contribute to this discussion. I, I struggle with the question of how can we communicate what the socio-ecological model is, what the multi-level framework means to the average voting mm -hmm. American or across the globe in such a way um, that they understand it, they don't see it as a political stance to be for or against, and so that we can really change the conversation around these major epidemics. Do you have any mm. any thoughts on what seems mm. to work with various stakeholders? Obviously, you have an audience of people who who agree with you, um, but uh, we are only so powerful. Yeah. Yeah, it's a 
<laughs> it's a great question. Um, probably the closest I've come to writing about this is I have a piece that came out in uh, Milbank uh, a few months ago called the Unhe An Unhealthy Mismatch. And the, the mismatch that I identify in it is the mismatch between we say we care about health, but we don't really care about population health. And I argue that there are two causes for that. Cause A is our science. I'll leave that aside. But cause B is our narrative, which is what you're getting at. So I try to sort of go into a little bit why I think this is. And I, 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 I think it's complicated, but I think largely we have been not very good at telling population health stories. And, the, and the, the health narrative, and I'm choosing my words carefully here, in this country, globally, but let's focus on this country, is exclusively, really exclusively, driven by a curative, curative or self-improvement narrative. Right. Those are the only two narratives that exist. And uh, so I actually think we have done a terrible job of giving a population health narrative that can work with multiple, with multiple audiences. Now, you, you ask me what I think works with multiple audiences. I'm not sure. I, I'm not, uh, to be honest with you, I'm actually not sure I'm the best vector for that message. I think there are people out there in this group, presumably, who are better than I am at that. But I, I do feel pretty strongly that we need a population health narrative. We need a population health narrative to start building to counter to really, there's drops in the bucket. Um, Dr. Bruno Domingo mentioned my last book, which was Healthier, 50 Thoughts on population, population Health, which was an interesting book. It was an academic book, really. It was 50 essays meant for academics. But it, it resonated far beyond academics, a little bit to my pleasant surprise, um, which gets me to feel like there's, there, there's eagerness out there. There are, there are people out there who want to hear these narratives. So this is, a, this is a challenge to all of us to come up with better narratives. In your... You go ahead, and then we'll go over there. In your thinking uh, about the ubiquitous causes, how do you calculate in wealth disparity and the continuing and growing wealth yeah. disparity? Yeah, the, um, actually, if I gave a, a a sort of a, a more quantitative talk, which I've done with this, I actually use a, um, an income heterogeneity numeric example um, on that, because I actually do think that uh, income heterogeneity, and I'm using, I'm using the term income heterogeneity with intentionality, because I think other terms tend to have much more political meaning. So I'm trying to be, I'm, I'm just trying to be descriptive. Um, I think it's hard to avoid that in this country, given where, where things are at right now. It's hard to avoid the foundational role of income gaps and even larger than that, wealth gaps. It's hard to avoid the fact that half the country essentially has its health indicators by any measure getting worse and worse as their, as their post-tax income and share of the national resources have been going down, owning absolutely no no equity, while you know the, the, the current economic success is being trumpeted as an increase in the stock market. Half the country doesn't affected by that. So we are at an inflection point, the likes of which we have not seen since the late 80s. And those of you who are students of population health trends in this country will know that it was the late 80s when we had this enormous downturn in the health of this country that we are still experiencing today. Uh, so I, I do think that that is foundational and cannot be avoided. In your number eight thing made a comment as you're speaking about this question about equity versus efficiency. And I'm curious how you would what you would say to the question about why we're having a question about the discussion on equity in the first place. What I worry about is if we aren't thinking about equity, that we as a power system mm -hmm. are just influencing the same issues as we think. I think there's good research out there that suggests that inequity itself perpetuates worse worse health. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious I guess why that's still an mm -hmm. academic debate from there. Let me understand the question as to why it's even a debate whether yeah, equity matters. Shouldn't be at the core. So you talk oh, about equity. I see. Well, well, well. Let, let's 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 take a concrete example. Okay. Suppose you are you are the health uh, health commissioner for a small town. Okay. And uh, and your colonoscopy screen rate is fifty percent. And the mayor, whose spouse died from colon cancer, she says to you. It really matters to me. I'm in an election platform. I want you to increase the colonoscopy screen rate from fifty percent to sixty percent. Right. So, okay, you have to do that. Well, what are you going to do? You know, you, you do a massive health education campaign and you increase colonoscopy screen rates from 50% to 60%. Now, what's likely to have happened when you did that? Well, you likely took people who are in higher socioeconomic position and you took them up to 70% and you left everybody else behind. So, I actually think that the reason I'm showing that a concrete example is because I actually think that while in the academic discourse, there is there's abundant literature on the clarity of the moral argument against health inequities, you know, going back decades and decades. I think pragmatically, when we're dealing with, the, with how population health becomes the practice of the health of the public, it's not so straightforward. And I actually think that we owe ourselves the intellectual honesty to highlight 
those, the, the, to highlight those challenges in order to provide guidance on it. So that's what I meant by it. Let's go here and then we'll go this way. Sure. Yeah, the question is, uh, what about the importance of how health is defined? Yeah, that's actually a very good. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we we don't do a good job of that in the principles. Uh, you know, I would probably subsume it under number one, but but in a fairly narrow way. I, I think there's a broader there's a broader point to be made that population health should grapple with um, around you know the classic WHO definition, WHO constitution. Health is a is a state of complete you know absence of disease, uh, complete physical and mental well being. I was thinking more in terms of the change. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think these are all important questions, and uh, they. Uh, I, I do think they have a place in a population health discussion, but we don't tackle it very much in the book. It's probably, it's probably a uh, an oversight. There's two more questions. We'll take one there, and I think there was another one on the other side. Uh, I appreciate the notion of needing a new population health narrative, but we actually had that population health narrative. It's called vaccination and sanitation. Mm -hmm. We did extraordinarily well. We basically turned these ubiquitous factors into non-factors for quite a bit of time. However, that has clearly been eroded. There was a Supreme Court decision that focused and targeted population health in 1905. It barely exists now because of all the waivers and all of the, uh, shall we say, hoopla around this notion of vaccination. We also have this same problem with sanitation, as we found out in Detroit, Michigan. So my question to you is, how do you keep the population health narrative going sure. when there are so many forces working against it? I'm trying to think whether to give you what I'm really thinking or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, right in 1850, which is not that long ago, 150 years, I mean, it's long for you and me, but in the human lifespan, it's short, right? Life expectancy was 40 to 42, right? I would challenge everybody in this room, how would you have made life decisions differently if you thought you're gonna die at 40? You know, you would, no, none of us would be sitting here, we'd be doing other things. Yeah. Right, then we gained in, enormous, right? This unprecedented in human history, gain in life expectancy, 30 to 40 years. Now, what's often lost in that narrative is that that gain happened principally between 1900 to 1950, where we gained about 21, 22 years. From 1950 to the present, we've gone down, we've gained about eight years, right? So it's really like we've, our gain has attenuated, and of course now life expectancy is going down, as I, as I pointed out. So what are we doing about that? Well, we are doubling down on precision medicine and many, and, and, and many of its, of its sib, sibling approaches, which are barrowing down to get us ever more precise genetic molecular approaches to to, to give us cures. Right? So clearly we're doing something wrong. I mean, we had a narrative, a narrative of success, which then gave way to less success, which then pushed us into this biomedical narrative. Now, you know, I think Dr. Glantz might say, with some reason, that part of that was driven by, uh, by commercial imperatives. I think part of it was driven by scientific imperatives. I think part of the problem is us, and by us I mean the scientific community. So I agree with you, there was a, pub a population health narrative. I would argue that we have very little of population health narrative right now. There was one more question over here. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you my, my one book that I'm excited about, which I'm not sure will be appropriate for a symposium here, but trying to, this is to Dr. Schillinger's, Schillinger's question, I'm trying to put my money where my mouth is. I have done something which I've never done in my career so far, which is I've written a book for a general audience. I'm trying to tell a, the story. The book is actually called What We Should Talk About But Don't When We Talk About Health. It'll be coming out next year. It was truly a stretch because everything I've ever written has been intended for you. Um, uh, and that's, uh, I, I felt like I had to go back to kindergarten to learn how to write for a general audience. Uh, so it, it really trying to like, trying to sort of do that and to get the word out there. It's part of our collective effort to get to create population narratives. Thank you very much for having me.